This is part four in our video series, How to Build Your Own Large Solar Generator. In this video, we'll be going over how to wire the components together inside the generator. Here's how it looks after the last step where we mounted all the components, including the solar power input, the LED work lights, which there are two of those, one on the top and one on the side, the um, weatherproof AC outlet for our inverter, as well as the remote power switch for the inverter to be able to turn our unit on and off. On the inside of the unit, we have already mounted our Optima battery, the solar charge controller, as well as the uh, main inverter. And then we also have a high current quick connector that we will be using for additional accessories such as jumper cables or increasing our battery bank. So the first thing we need to do is start routing the primary power cables to the inverter towards the battery to work out some of our routing. These cables were connected in the last step. This is how we're going to be distributing the power in our generator. It's a six circuit fuse panel for the positives and for the grounds we'll be using this bus bar. I'll also be using two sets of the inexpensive battery cables with pre-crimped connectors that will be used to run the power to our distribution blocks as well as running the power to our high current quick connector. These are the uh, connectors that for the quick connect, so we're going to need to cut the old connectors off of these cables and crimp on the new ones. These are pretty thick cables. You'll probably need a pretty decent set of wire cutters and strippers to cut these. These ones were struggling a little bit. I was eventually able to get them to work. Um, alternately, you could also just take a sharp knife and gently cut the insulation off. Once you have the insulation stripped off, you just slide them into this crimped. And there's a couple different ways you can crimp these. I happen to have some really large, heavy-duty crimpers made for large gauge wire like this. Um, they tend to be pretty expensive. So as an alternate, you can also use a punch and a hammer where you would be literally taking the punch and making an indentation into the side of the crimp. As you can see, that is pretty much what these industrial crimpers do as well. Once you have the negative side complete, we're going to do the same thing for the positive. So when you're finished, you'll have one set of cables with the quick connectors on one side and the factory crimps on the other. Now we rotate these so that the sharp edge is rotated up, and if you have them correct, when you put them in, you should hear a positive click. Make sure you put the red cable in on the positive side and the black cable in on the negative side. Once these are both inserted, it will help us determine the length that we have to work with with our distribution blocks. And we're going to connect those in the middle between two sets of cables. One set will lead to the battery, and the other set will lead to our high current conductors. We're going to sandwich these onto the lug using a combination of the washer, a spring washer, and then a nut. The way we want it arranged, and then gently tighten it down fairly snug with a wrench, but don't tighten so much that you break the plastic base plate. Follow the same process for our bus bar. We're going to sandwich the two ends of the cables onto the one end of the bus bar. Now that we have all of the wires connected, we can start arranging them how we're going to be able to mount the things into the case. And we know how much length of wire we have to work with for our cable routing. I've temporarily connected the cables to the battery. Keeping in mind you have to be very careful at this point because now that we have cables connected to the battery, things can short out. But we needed to be able to know exactly how we can route the wires so that once we have them mounted in, the lengths will work out. Once you have the arrangement that you like, we use the hot melt glue gun to temporarily hold it in place. Once the glue has cooled enough to hold it from moving on you, you can go ahead and put a heavier layer of glue all the way around the entire outside of the component. Same process for our ground distribution bar. as well as for our six circuit fuse panel.
Before we unhook the battery cables, we also want to put a couple zip ties on there to help give us a shape so that our wires can stay in the routing pattern that we want to keep them in. Once you have done that, we can now unhook the negative cables from our battery for the rest of our build. This will make it much safer to be working with the wires while we are wiring the rest of the components. For the first LED light, we need to cut the wire to the right length to be able to reach our switch. Once it is cut, strip off the uh, outer insulation as well as the insulation for the two inductors inside. Now because our power switch also has an indicator light, it will need its ground wire as well. So taking the free end from our roll of black wire, we're going to strip that and we're going to connect it with the black wire from our light onto the same crimp. That way they will both be sharing the ground and we can connect that straight to our power switch. For the majority of our connections we will be using crimp on slide connectors. Um, I, I will be using a combination of two sizes, either blue or yellow. The blue work for the smaller wire gauges and the yellow for the larger wire gauges. Once that is crimped, we can go ahead and crimp another crimp to the red power wire for the LED light. Both of these will be leading to our switch and then we're going to need to run a power wire to the switch from our distribution block. So we're going to take the free end from our red spool of wire, we're going to strip it off and we're going to put a crimp onto that. Once that is crimped, we now will have the three connectors that we need for this switch. The switch that we are using has a brass colored connector. This connector is the ground connection. The one in the middle is the load for our circuit and then the third connector is the power source from the battery. So for the LED light, that means we're going to hook the connector with the black wires to the brass colored prong, the red wire that goes to the LED light to the middle connector, and finally our red long wire to the third connector. I'm also going to take a zip tie and zip tie these to one of our mounting screws to provide a little bit of strain relief. These long wires will also be going to our power distribution center, so cut them to length with a little bit of extra to make them routed nicely. Now we're going to go ahead and repeat the exact same process for our other LED work lights. Once we have our second light wired, we'll go ahead and move the wires out of the way to get ready to wire the connections for our USB power ports, digital voltmeter, and cigarette lighter port. Now these will all be wired into the same switch. And because we will be using the same switch for all of them, we can wire all the devices into parallel, and we will accomplish that with a technique called daisy chaining. What this basically means is we will connect the power wire like before, and we'll run the load wire to each device and we're just going to place a fold where we want each of the connectors to be on the wire for the power pin of each of the components. When we get to the final component, we will snip the wire off. Now we will take our wire back off of the switch connector and we will cut it at each of our folds. Now we will strip the ends of each of our segmented wires and then we will twist them together where they had been folded and then add a crimp. When finished you should have one wire with a total of four slide connectors on it. We will go ahead and hook it back up to the accessory position or the load position on our switch and then to the power pin for each of the components on this circuit. Using this technique reduces the number of wires that you will see inside the case. We're going to use the same technique for the ground connection. The only exception is that for the ground connection, the long wire leading to our distribution block will also be part of our daisy chain. So 
starting at one point, work your way to each of the components and putting a full to each connector. The order that you use for these connections is not important because electrically speaking, they are all connected to the same point. When you have finished with this daisy chain, you should have a total of four connections as well as the wire still leading to your spool. Go ahead and connect them to the negative pin on each of these components. And once you have finished that, then you can run the length of your wire over to where your distribution block will be, keeping again that you will have to run it nicely around the perimeter of your case, and then trim that to the right length. It's always a good idea to give yourself a little bit of extra length so that you can make sure that everything is routed nice and neatly without straining any of the wires. Once you have finished wiring up this component, it should look like this. At this point, we now have a power wire and a ground wire for every single one of our accessories for our unit. We're going to go ahead and start bundling these together as neatly as possible, starting at the components and working our way back towards the distribution block. When routing the wires for the light on the lid, make sure you keep enough extra slack near the hinge so that the hinge can open and close freely without putting any strain on the wires. Separate the positive wires from the negative wires. We're going to be routing the negative wires to our bus bar, so let's go ahead and do that first. Now electrically speaking, all of these connections are the same point. So it does not matter which wires go to which screw terminals, and you can even share a couple wires onto one screw terminal if they fit nicely into your crimps. As you cut your wires to length, go ahead and connect them to try to keep things as neat so that you can trim the other ones to the proper length without putting a lot of strain on our wires. After we have all of the ground wires connected, we can move on to the power wires. On our distribution block, each one of the blade connectors represents one fuse circuit. Most of these circuits we will want to be on their own dedicated fuse. The one exception to that would be that I want both of the work lights to share the same circuit. So I'm going to start with those. We want to find the two wires for both of our LED lamps, and we want to cut them to the length so that they can share the connector onto the same blade connector on our fuse distribution block. Once we have that, we can then start following the wires from our charge controller and connect that to its own circuit. And we will use the same procedure for the uh, power wire for the battery maintainer and trickle charger, as well as the power wire that goes to our combination voltage gauge, USB outlets, and automotive outlet. If you wired both of your lights to the same circuit like I did, that will leave you with two additional pins for future upgrades. Now at this point, all the wires have been wired, so we can go ahead and connect our battery connection back up on the negative post, and you will immediately see that the blown fuse light will illuminate on several of the circuits for our fuse block. That's because we have not actually put the fuses in yet. Now that all of our internal wiring is complete, we can go ahead and insert our fuses and test our components. Now because we are using a 30 amp charge controller, we want to put a 30 amp fuse onto the circuit that comes from that. We're also going to use a 30 amp fuse for our 12 volt automotive socket because that is the capacity for our wire. For our LED work lights, we will be using a 10 amp fuse. And finally, we will be using a 5 amp fuse for the battery maintainer and trickle charger circuit. Once all the fuses are installed, we can go ahead and reinstall the clear plastic cover that came with our fuse block. Now we can go ahead and test our switched accessories, including the LED lights, as well as the 12 volt panel on the front that has our battery gauge, USB power ports, as well as our cigarette style 12 volt power output. We can also test our inverter outlet. And you should see the green GFI circuit light up once you turn on the remote switch. We can also test that the GFI circuit is working 
by pushing the test button on our GFI outlet. The lights should turn back on once you hit the reset button. Now that the main unit is complete, we need to add a wire extension to our solar panel. The back of our solar panel comes pre-wired with MC4 connectors, as well as a couple of MC4 pigtails. To build the extension cable itself, we are going to be using a high quality 16 gauge speaker wire. This has the advantage over solar wire in that it is bundled together and it will be easy to coil, more flexible for portable use. It will have plenty of current capacity for our needs. To connect it to the uh, MC4 pigtails, we need to go ahead and strip the insulation off one end of our speaker wire and we're going to go ahead and use butt splice connectors to crimp them to our MC4 pigtails. We want to make sure that we connect the red speaker wire to the pigtail that connects to the plus labeled solar panel connection. Then, the, of course, the black wire will go to the other pigtail, which is labeled with the minus tag. Once both splices are complete, we are going to add some electrical tape to provide some strain relief, as well as to keep our connections watertight. Winding the roll of tape around the wires, as you see me doing here, provides for nice and tight wraps. After going back and forth over our connections with three or four layers, we should have a very nice, dense wrap of tape. At this point, we're going to want to uncoil as much speaker wire as we want to have for our extension on our solar panel. I decided to coil off what I could wrap up nice and neatly, which was approximately about 20 feet. This should give me plenty of flexibility for positioning the panel in direct sunlight, even if I'm working in areas that are somewhat shady. Go ahead and cut the wire and strip it off like we did before. We are going to be connecting this wire to the other end of the 6-pin trailer connection that we are using for our solar power input. Don't forget to slide the housing portion of the connector on before you make your connections. We are going to want to put the uh, red 12 volt wire to the center pin connection and the black wire to the connection labeled as ground, just like we did on the generator half. Once the connections are made, go ahead and reassemble the connector and then tighten down the wire clamp on the other end of our trailer connector. Now the clamp wasn't able to provide good strain relief with the thickness of the speaker wire that I had, so I'm also using some hot melt glue to improve the strain relief at this point. Now the only thing left to wire at this point is the quick connector for our jumper cables. We're going to take the set of jumper cables and we're going to go ahead and cut the clamps off on one end. We will then want to go ahead and strip enough insulation off for our high current connectors. Now because both of these wires are bonded close together, we want to make sure that we install the crimps so that they are rotated in the correct direction to be inserted into our high current conductor. We also want to provide some additional tape at each one of these crimps to provide some strain relief as well as some insulation to make sure that none of the stray strands from the wire can possibly per cause a short. At that point we can go ahead and insert them into the housing for our high current quick connector. They should lock firmly into place. And that wraps up all the wiring for our solar generator. At this point we have a fully functioning unit. I will probably do another video with a couple finishing touches such as adding a cord wrap to our solar panel as well as adding a protective cover for inside our enclosure that will protect the electrical connectors if we decide to use the additional space for storage.